about yourself hi guys so i am vani i am a tabu question ambassador and also working as a data visualization engineer right now at expedia group and uh, apart from working you can just find me you know reading singing or traveling uh, it is i have not been able to travel a lot in covid but i'm hoping to again get back into it now that things have settled down uh, besides that you can always connect with me on you know linkedin and twitter or instagram and besides all that i also write i have, have my own blog page where i share a lot of tips and tricks especially around actual business use cases and without any further delay a uh, very happy international women's day to all of you especially and we are really really glad today to have two amazing women with us who will be speaking on some great topic first we have ansula uh, who is right now working as a data visualization expert at zoom and she will be talking about uh, how and why minimalistic design and then we have julia uh, a person present can you move to slide to the next one and then we have julia who is right now working at, as a data artist at the smart consulting uh, ag and will be hearing about how she became a data artist from an artist so again without any further delay we'll just hand off to ansula thanks thanks prasanna yes. uh, yeah prasanna you saying please go ahead yeah great so i'll share my screen let me know if it's up Yes, yes, it's again. there. Great. Okay. It's minimizing a window. So I'm going to speak about minimalism, and this is a very common buzzword that I'm sure a lot of you have heard and know a little bit about it. People around you must be speaking about this word. Uh, you know, you must have definitely heard about it, and. if not heard about it you definitely know that there are some thought leaders like steve jobs who is a minimalist right and he follows a zen philosophy where he thinks that uh, simply reducing some non essential things from life really adds a lot of more value uh, i'm sure you have also seen mark zuckerberg he also follows a very minimalist lifestyle because he thinks that if he has to choose one less thing every single morning when he wakes up what to wear each day uh, he thinks that it actually gives him a little bit more time in taking the good important decisions in his life right so this is a very um, very common buzzword that people are talking about these days and as data artists right uh, there are some people who have started practicing this particular approach towards their data visualizations um i also know a few um painters and uh, some of the artists who actually make only abstract images in their paintings and they sell those paintings for a bomb right and you must be wondering oh these are just squares and rectangles and circles and how are these paintings getting sold so uh, so costly right so um before i even get into what is minimalism and all let's just talk about why are we talking about this topic today right so we as data visualization engineers experts in our own field uh, or just someone who is working on data as an artist we have uh, a lot of information that comes to us right a lot of data that comes to us and it's sometimes very hard to decide what to keep on the dashboard what to discard and you know how should we go about things right even if you are not a data visualization expert or do not use any power bi or bi tool over here that's absolutely okay because i'm sure in some point in your life you would have definitely made a presentation and this will in a way also benefit you right before i talk about this approach let me do a quick round of introduction for myself so this is anshula i have almost close to 10 years of experience working on data visualization I worked for almost more than 150 dashboards, which supported uh, almost or a lot of Fortune 500 clients, and I am really excited to be part of the Tableau Buddy group today, speaking on this occasion of Women's Day. Thank you so much, Prasanna and Vani, to you know have me over here. A little bit more about me: I love traveling. Music is in my soul, and visualization is something that really excites and motivates me every single day of my life. right so let's 
begin and let's start discussing as to what is not a minimalist approach to data visualization right so there are a lot of myths about minimalism and we are just going to start with that um the first one which people uh, think mostly is that minimalism is about avoiding complex charts or dashboards right they feel that if i'm creating complex visuals on my dashboard then i am not creating a minimal dashboard now this is something that's actually not true right you could still be creating some complex chart let's say for example sankey chart right but you might still be conveying the point that you want to from your data it can still be a minimalist chart or a dashboard right so your minimalist dashboard doesn't necessarily need to avoid a complex chart or a visual the other misconception that people usually have around this is they feel that minimalism is nothing but you know simplicity so you should only build charts that have bar graphs or pie charts or you know just basic looking charts only then you are building a minimalist dashboard and that's absolutely wrong now i'm sure you must be wondering anshla you're contradicting yourself right the point number 1 and point number 2 they don't really uh, they don't sound right if you're saying they should they can be complex and they can also be simple and they can't be simple so how is all of this uh, sinking in together so the idea is to not create a simple or complex chart but the idea is to create what is really necessary and should be available on your dashboard right so like i said right we have lot of information lot of data that comes to us but then understanding what will drive the story what will make it more meaningful keeping only the things that are necessary and discarding stuff that's not is actually minimalism one of the other most common misconception that people have is if you are making a minimalist dashboard then you cannot use bright colors or you should stick to only monochromatic colors right so they feel that if you have a uh, if you are making a minimal dashboard then you will only use a couple of colors or just tones from the same color palette but that's not true right you can definitely use bright colors on your dashboard but the colors on your dashboard should be for a purpose they should solve a purpose why they are there or why are they over there in the dashboard right so you can use any colors dull boring bright whatever suits you but it should be there for a purpose the last one is this is something i've observed a lot of people who create minimalist dashboards have observed this that no people create a uh, great looking minimalist dashboards but what they do is they hide a lot of information in the tool tips or maybe you know give a link to the next tab and you know provide all of the other information over there so the information is available but it is somehow hidden not directly visible to the to the end user or the stakeholder so what happens in this scenario is um, the user sometimes doesn't know where does he fetch that information from so even that is a is a preconceived notion that people think that if you are you know just you can just hide some of the information just leave a plain basic dashboard over there and you will you you can call yourself as a minimalist dashboard right but that's not true right so these are some of the myths about um uh, you know a minimalist dashboard now before i go any further i would like to take a quick example over here okay so let's take a quick example of two people um one of them has got five pair of shoes and all of these five pairs are basically same shoes okay so it's the same black shoe that the person has but has five um uh, pairs of the same shoe right there is one more person who has 10 pair of shoes he gave away five of them they are different but he has he also has five shoes but they are different right if you ask me in my opinion both of these people are minimalist because they have their own unique approach towards minimalism one is you know keeping it in mind that he only have a single type of shoes but the other one is trying to declutter or remove unessential things from his closet to make it more uh, you know more simple okay so uh, 
even as data artists, right, we all have our own unique approaches towards visualization. The way I build visualization couldn't be the way you build your visualization, right? We are all unique and we all have our own different approaches towards it. So this is a progressive journey and you will reach there, right? As soon as you start, you don't, you can't, you know, discard everything and say, oh, I'm just going to follow the minimalist approach. That's not going to happen. It's, it's going to be a progressive journey and you're going to learn and grow and slowly upscale yourself on this journey. So um, just a quick small note over here that we are all data artists and are all unique. And what minimalism could be me, could be to me, couldn't be the same to you as well. So it, it is a very subjective uh, approach over here. So let's talk about how can we build some of these minimal dashboards, right? And I hope I was able to convey that what exactly is a minimal dashboard. and. Um, there are the various approaches to build dashboards that are clutter free, removing access information and keeping what is really, really important onto the dashboard. But we'll just discuss a few important points that are on the top of my head to see how you can simplify, uh, you know, the visuals that you have on, on your particular viz. So let's begin with the first one. It's about using big readable headings, right? So if you see uh, the dashboard that's on your screen right now, uh, some of the things over here are quite clear and you can easily make out what is the dashboard trying to convey, right? So the headings are clear, they are bold and they are readable to the user. So if the headings are readable, you are able to convey what you're trying to say on your dashboard. But if the headings are not huge enough, for somebody to catch, you know, look at them and know what it is on the dashboard, then it really becomes difficult for somebody to understand the story flow around it. So uh, the first thing is have big readable headings. I myself prefer using graphic Apple Gothic fonts, but then it is up to individuals and your stakeholders, whatever font works best for you, please choose that, but just make sure that it is readable. The next one is using abstract tiles and adding a little bit of roundness to the elements on your UI page, right? So if you see right now, uh, some of these things on your screen, they have a little bit of roundness to the UI element, the top metrics, the bars on the bottom, they're all a little bit curved. They don't have sharp edges. Right, so you can always basically switch from a tile to this. And I know Tableau doesn't really directly, uh, you know, allows you to make containers which are rounded, but there are a lot of hacks and workarounds, you know, that you can follow and make sure that, uh, you know, just add a little bit of more element to it. It doesn't really have to be rounded, but any uh, element that can add a little bit of more um, intuitiveness and great looking, uh, aesthetic to your dashboard can, you know, can clearly change uh, how it looks. The next one and one of my favorites one over here is using the colors and the contrast very thoughtfully. So if you see right now on your screen, right, the legends for, um, for this particular one, they've used two colors, blue and green, one for business subscription and for monthly subscription. And if you see, even the tooltip is following that same color legend. So it's very, very clear for somebody who even sees the tooltip, they don't have to read uh, what it is for that number stands for, right? The color is so specific, you can easily make that out from it. So using the colors in a thoughtful way and making sure that they complement each other, contrast with each other, but don't overload your dashboards with colors. Right, use it for a purpose. The next one is using bright backgrounds and making sure that there is enough white space. So a lot of times we, you know, tend to uh, just put everything into our dashboard, but we just forget that there is not enough white space in the dashboard, right? So there is just a lot of graphs and a lot of charts, but then there's no space on the dashboard. So a little bit of white space 
can make and break your dashboards and highlighting the colors that really uh, stand out. And if you want to particularly highlight something over there on your screen, you see the dark purple out there in the bar chart, you easily can identify and grab somebody's attention to it as soon as they look at it, right? So just make sure that you have enough amount of white space uh, in your dashboard. Don't overload it with a lot of visuals. The last one on my list is using illustrations or icons. Um, and this is a very, very basic dashboard that you see on your screen, right? It just has some KPIs on top, a bar graph, and some line graphs in the bottom half of the dashboard, right? And you see there are small icons for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And then on the bottom, near the followers, likes, and comments, these icons are very, very generic icons. And you know anybody who looks at it for the very first time would be able to make sense out of it, right? So like is a heart and everybody knows that it is right so even if the label was not present over there somebody who's looking for this dashboard for the very first time can still make out that it is for likes so uh using illustrations and icons always um gets you a little bit more focus on smaller details on your dashboard but when you're choosing icons make sure that these icons are not um very bold or not very or, you know, they, they basically should be uh, simple, but still be able to convey what you're trying to say in your in your story. So these are some of the ways in which you can uh, start building a minimal dashboard. Right? Now, the question comes is that why should I switch from a normally aesthetically great looking dashboard to a minimal dashboard? The first point that I have over here is that these dashboards load much faster than your traditional dashboards, right? If you start following a minimalist approach, then your dashboard re would require lesser resources to load and also to build, right? So you're saving time, not just in creating the visualization, but also when these visuals are up uh, live running on some platforms, they're loading much faster. So it gives that upper hand when it comes to, you know, some of these minimal dashboards. The next thing is you don't end up searching for things and anything that's on your dashboard is there for a purpose, right? You're not creating things just because you have that data. You're creating because it's necessary and it's important. You're not overloading the composition, the UI with a lot of information. And anybody who lands on your dashboard for the very first time knows exactly what they're seeing, right? So you don't have to search. And this brings me to my last point, which is providing a great user experience. So these minimalist dashboards, which are clutter free, provide more clarity, also provide a great user experience. So somebody who lands on to some of these dashboards is not going to forget the pleasure of working with something like that, right? Uh, they will forget a cluttered dashboard. They will forget um, a, a dashboard which was overwhelmed with information, but they will not forget a minimal dashboard. So uh, with that, I would like to say, please create less, convey more information. Um, there is no one size fits all. So what is minimalism to me might not be minimalism to you, but then whatever you create should be created for a particular purpose. Um, because if that is not being used, it is literally useless and um, just keep some of the essential things. This is a journey and take it at your own pace. Uh, it, it is what it is, right? So if you're seeing a particular dashboard and you like it, that's it, right? So it is what it is. Do not remove things from your dashboard, but do not overload it, do not add things, just provide a lot of clarity and remove some of the clutter. And then you should be on the journey to minimalism, right? So that's all that I wanted to speak today. And I'm really open to some of the questions that you guys might be having. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, uh, over to Prasan and Vani back. Thank you so much, Ansula. It was a really great session. Uh, so I had a couple of questions on uh, myself. Uh, yeah. I really want to you know, focus a lot of minimalism in my own work and my dashboards. But, you know, a lot of times while working, uh, especially the senior people, senior clients and stakeholders, they have not really seen this a lot when they were working years ago. 
and it's really difficult you know to actually make them understand why minimalism is important or how it's it's a good thing now especially so have you ever faced it i mean how do you convince such clients to incorporate minimalism yeah i have faced clients like that and recently also i faced an issue where uh, my clients want to only go with tables you know they are, they are so exactly. used to it that they don't want to go away right but i always yeah. tell people that uh, when you're trying to convince somebody you need to show them both the versions right you need to show them how the table would look and behave and how the visual that you're building would look and behave and then mm-hmm. you let them decide and i'm sure when they see it they'll love it and they'll pick it so it's okay. as simple as that okay thank you i'll try that and uh, the second thing are there certain softwares or you know certain websites which you use for creating your own designs before you actually implement them in any software i know figma is one of them yeah i really don't use any uh, particular softwares or any to be frank but then i do get inspired by you know visual that people create so i follow uh, people uh, on linkedin on on other channels right. but i also uh, take a lot of information from pinterest and dribble these are my two constants so there are a lot of different dashboards that people don't really create uh, on tableau but these are great looking dashboards so you can get inspired from them and use some of those inspirations on your dashboards as well yeah absolutely thank you so much there is a question from tanmay uh sometimes simple dashboard can take some major roles absolutely that's right tanmay they can right but as i said right it's not making simple it is making minimal and they are both completely different right you don't overload but don't be very simple as well right just don't make it too basic right that's uh, very important thing yes uh, ansula i do have a question as well and uh, first uh, i'm very much like uh, i'm very much in awe with your presentation that that was just fabulous i'll say and uh, because uh, you talked about a lot that uh, minimalism is very much subjective so uh, it cannot be bucketed into like uh, there cannot be a specific bucket for this so so now uh, if if i overall summarize the webinar that that we just went through uh, there is a lot to process i'll say for for someone who is new uh, there is a lot to process so uh, if if i have to uh, tell the uh, same to uh, someone who is just starting uh, even some like uh, in few points how would you suggest uh, minimalism is actually in in few points for a simple person who, who has just started yeah, i'll just say that uh just go with your gut you know just start putting up things on the dashboard whatever you know and then just go back and think what you've created and put on that particular dashboard is it really serving any purpose if not just remove it from your dashboard so everything that comes on to your dashboard should actually be serving a story or a purpose and that's the reason why it should be there on the dashboard and somebody who's just starting and doesn't know uh, you know what exactly would a minimal dashboard look like as i said right it is a progressive journey it takes long to reach there right you can't say that i'll throw up all my clothes today and i'll become a minimalist right you can't do that you will start discarding few things one by one and that's how you will be able to reach there so it's it's a journey it can't start on day 1 but then uh, you should always be thoughtful about the things that you're putting onto your dashboard and that's how you will be able to slowly and steadily get there yes uh, i think uh, that sounds pretty much uh, comfortable like uh, as a person who has, who's just starting up i just need to think it over that what should be there and what should not be there and that's it's it's somehow uh, we learn step by step also uh, if i have to i'll just add one more point to this uh, because uh, this is something i specifically do is i try to role play yeah. i try to put myself uh, like if the dashboard is being used by someone who is a vp or uh, someone a travel uh, manager i would just try to put myself in their shoes and think about what they want actually and then you can design all of it so uh, that's a great I point think, uh, that's- 
that's a great point but sometimes our stakeholders don't know what they exactly need right so because Actually. they are not they are not data scientists they are not visualization experts right they just they just want something but they don't know how it should look like so i think the path and the vision should come from the person who's building it but then you also like you said right you have to keep that person also in mind when you're trying to solve a particular problem will this actually serve the purpose that the person really requested this dashboard for right is it going to really help or is it just going to be another dashboard you know in the piles of dashboard that the other person has so just think about uh, whatever you are building everything can be minimalist and everything uh, you know uh, it, there is no hard and fast rule over there it's just what you like and how do you want to convey your story just don't overwhelm people with information that's it Those Thank are all you. the Thank points. You. Great. Uh, I want to try and implement some of those while working regularly, guys. So, uh, Ansula is still there on the call. If you want uh, to ask anything, you can just send it over chat, and she can answer it over there. And with this, we would like to, you know, start with uh, Julia. Thank you very much. So, uh, so please. Uh, so uh, yeah, just go ahead. Sorry, sorry for the intersection there. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm good. So I'm sharing my screen to all of you guys now. So first of all, I'm super happy to be here. First to the user group buddy talk. I'm really honored and yay. So. For me, today is all about how to get into um, a career as a data artist or a, or a Tableau consultant. And the first question I have for all of you, please write in the chat what you thought you would become when you finished high school or your first degree, what you thought you would your job would be like, and then follow it up with what your job actually is. So I'm really excited to hear uh, to hear um, what all of you um, developed into. So today I'm here to talk about um, how I came from building sculptures to building dashboards, because I actually started out as an artist and now I am a, a Tableau consultant, a data artist. So uh, this is what probably all of you think being an artist looks like. So this is Bob Ross, probably the most famous TV painter um, in, in television history. And he's really famous for doing all these landscapes and lovely clouds and, and lovely trees. And all of his pictures are really good to hang on your wall and easy to paint. But that's actually not what the art world is about today, or this is not the art that people make or that is um, uh, taught at uh, art school. So here is an example of my work. This is actually my graduation project. And as you can see, it's very site specific, very abstract. It's not at all a picture that you can hang on a wall. It's hard to sell. and from a picture very hard to understand, right? So what I did, I took this room that had no windows and I painted the floor white. You can see that the people really stand on a white surface. And I put these lights on the fixtures above and, and made this, this uh, um, orange tone so that it kind of had this really, I don't know, just weird feeling of being in a room. And this is the next one, uh, also an art project where I, I put just also white on the floor and I put holes in it so that people could like jump from hole to hole. And, and it's, it's really hard to sell and really hard to make money with, right? So, so all of these things I did in art school, I had a good time, it was lovely uh, being an art student. So, Next, I'm going to show you what I thought my future would look like as an artist. This is famous artist Louise Bourgeois. And I thought, you know, I'd be an old lady someday surrounded by my art, 
doing what I love all day, that I quickly realized that my future would look like this. Driving a taxi or teaching art to children who are really not into art or selling flowers. So I realized very quickly it was very hard to make any money at all with art. And from all the people I know during my eight years of studying art, uh, there's only one person that is actually successful and she's able to live off of her art and, and sell her pieces and show them in museums and galleries. One person, and I've known probably 200 people. So I realized this two, three years into my art studies and I started looking for alternatives. So I thought I would do something really useful and study Turkish language because I'd been on holiday in Turkey and I thought, oh, wow, there's also so many Turkish people in Germany and I'm going to learn Turkish and, and be really like, know what they're talking about on the bus. And then I also studied social work because I thought, oh, great, I'll have a job, I'll be able to work and then I'll be able to do my art on the side. But when I graduated, I, I did all of these simultaneously, right? So when I graduated, I had like three different diplomas and I looked at, um, at this graph, it's wages by occupation. And I, you know, I started at the top and, uh, and looked like, okay, where, I, where am I? So I started at the top and I went down and I went down and I, I thought like, okay, artist, social work, Turkish speaker, hmm, where am I? So I finally arrived at the very bottom. So I congratulated myself on picking two of the three lowest paying jobs in the entire job market. Here you can see social work and uh, below that is artist. So I congratulated myself and said, oh God, and I don't even like children so much. So I kind of felt like this is not it for me. This is not the job for me. I have to go look for something else. I have to go on a big search and just find my true dream job. And I kind of imagined it to be like, okay, I'm really hungry. And I know that there's the perfect meal but I'm standing in the supermarket and I don't know what the perfect meal is. I don't know what I need and I don't know where to find it, right? So I had this feeling I have, I just don't know what my perfect job is. So I, I, I searched for six months or even more. I, I knew I, I would be on a big journey and I knew it would be really a long time before I find it and I, I knew I just had to search. So I went to a lot of, um, a lot of these job um, events where I talked to many companies and I, I tried to really know about all these kind of new jobs like for example, scrum master, product owner, nobody teaches you that at university. My parents are architects. They don't know anything about these kind of new jobs. So I, I, I was just searching and also looking at things that I would never um, dream of doing because I was just being curious. So I went to this one event where this company called Woodmark Consulting, they offered a Tableau workshop. And they said something like, oh, it's data visualization. And as an artist, I kind of caught the, the thing with visualization. I was like, okay, it's something visual that, you know, that might be something for me. Uh, I'm an artist. And so I went to them and I said, hi, I'm an artist. Can I work for you? And they said, oh, we're looking for a data artist. And I had no idea what that was. And I took the flyer in my hand. I went home into my hotel room. This was a like a two, three day long affair. And I went to my hotel room and I remember I, I opened my laptop. I put in into Google data art and I was lost from the first Google search result. I knew that this was my perfect job, that I have found it and that this would be my uh, further occupation. And I went back to them and I said, um, you know what, this data artist thing really blew my mind and that's it. Uh, that's what I want to do. Where can I, um, where 
can I, um, where can I apply? And he said, just give me your CV and uh, that's fine. So I never wrote an application. I just gave that person my CV. And here I am two years later, I'm now senior consultant and still uh, have the job title data artist. And I'm really happy and very satisfied also with, the, with everything that came with it, uh, namely the Tibler community. So for my first biz, I, I published this and it's, uh, so I combined my two passions. It's a visualization about um, artists and uh, female artists in the Tate Gallery collection of London. And uh, this was my very first visualization and it really helped me to visualize data about art because I know so much about art, how the art world world works and how um, artworks are really categorized and talked about. So that was just uh, great for me to get into it. Um, and then I, I started out being a part of the Gipfelstürmer. This is a three months long program uh, that all of us did together. And some of those people studied like engineering or mathematics and I studied art. I had no idea about anything. I was not into IT at all. I could barely open a computer and, and but I was really willing to get into it. And um, I was really motivated because I knew I need this to be a data artist. Um, and so it's totally worth it. And it was so hard, like the first three months of changing from like social work and art to, to IT world and to data is so hard, really. It felt like failing some days and there was just so much to learn. And some days I felt like my, my head would explode from so much knowledge that I would uh, put into my head and I felt really confused and asked myself what am I doing here and how crazy is that really but um, I can but it got it got better over time and I, I like to compare it to the stages of a culture shock um, I've lived in Nepal I've lived in Turkey I've lived in the United States so I really um, have some experience with culture shock and it felt really similar so first you have this euphoria, like, yeah, I found, found my perfect job. But then you have this kind of shock that suddenly your whole, um, the whole company culture is different and the people are very different and very differently socialized. And, um, and I asked myself, do I fit in here? And, and is this really like, was this really a good decision? And then you kind of like, get the hang of things and it, it's getting easier and uh, finally kind of come in the, into this place of acceptance where you know how things are and you know how you are and, and both kind of come together. Um, and I'm still kind of like the, the quirky person in the company, um, once an artist, always an artist, but we have found a wonderful way of working together and uh, humor and uh, just laughing about things has always helped me a lot to um, be able to cope with that stress and also to cope with that change. Like for example, a random fuzzy forest is really an algorithm. But when I heard this word, I kind of felt like I, of a very blurry forest where lens is unfocused and somebody is really confused and asks herself, what am I doing in this forest and why is it so unfocused? And I, I made these little jokes on, um, on PowerPoint. I sent them to my colleagues and said, oh, it's so funny, look what we learned yesterday. And they were all really irritated because they weren't used to thinking so visually. Um, and usually I always have a lot of images in my head um, and I think in pictures, basically, or when we learned about data models, and, and then somebody talked about a data model for blockchain, aren't you also thinking about a model that's holding a chain? Uh, well, I had a lot of fun with this, and it kind of brightened my day to, to be humorous about it. So I continued my data visualization journey and uh, transitioned to making a lot more business-like dashboards. Um, uh, this is about analyzing stores 
and um, started also being a trainer. And look at my wages now. I um, have uh, risen from the very bottom to kind of like the upper middle section, um, at least in Germany, that's the case. So I'm really happy about this and um, never thought that money would be so important, but um, it is quite, it's only then not important if you are comfortable with money, right? And if it's always a difficult issue, then money is very important. So I continued to um, involve my um, knowledge and my skills as an artist in my uh, consulting work. So this is a um, blog article about business intelligence, uh, about layout for business intelligence dashboards. Uh, uh, by the way, it's been translated into English. So now it's available in English. And, uh, and here I talk about the how, how do you place elements on a dashboard and what does it um, uh, yeah yeah what does it make your users um, do with your dashboard what are the different options what are um, the positives and negatives about it but I also filmed a few videos explaining Tableau in 100 seconds I scripted those videos and somebody else filmed it but here I was also able to to use some skills that um, are not technical, but are more um, soft skills to be um, successful in my job, even though I um, don't have a technical background at all. I started buying books. These are all the books I have. Probably I have bought one or two more since I took that photo. I love uh, just collecting books on data visualization. I usually enter a bookshop and ask people if they have books about data visualization. And then I buy, buy all of them. Uh, that's uh, really lovely. And uh, what probably helped me the most were really other people. And these are all the people that are really important to me. Um, so Chantilly Jaggernaut, she did a, a video about dashboards that, yeah, that was just blew my mind. But also the Flairlash twins, I actually reached out to one of them on, on LinkedIn and just said, hey, I love your template, but here's something that um, I don't understand. Can you help me? And he was like, yeah, sure. I think it's so cool. You were an artist once. So it's really awesome how close people are and how easy it is to get in touch with them. But probably most important are my two colleagues, Nico and Patricia. So um, to just have people in my company to be able to talk to, to exchange, to um, people to support you and just be, be friendly at the end of the day. And here's a picture of me at my wedding. We are the two people with the flowers in the hair. And these are all of my colleagues. So four of my colleagues um, joined us uh, for our wedding. And that's just lovely um, to have such a good social uh, structure. So here's a list of all the topics that really busy myself with, even when I sleep. Sometimes I wake up thinking about this. So it's visual best practices and also colors for communication. I love color theory, so you better not get me started on that topic. I would not stop talking for at least two hours. But I also love data literacy um, and to be able to communicate data to people who are either not used to it or just starting out. And my latest pet peeve is UX for dashboards, user experience design. And I'm still researching the hell out of this topic. Uh, and yeah, it's really interesting. So looking back, there were so many times I really had no idea what I was doing. But then also I, I really had um, went to the point where I did memes myself about data visualization, this meme I created. Um, one does not simply change the color in a data viz. So I kind of, when, when reflecting and finding this in my pictures, I thought, okay, I finally, I have settled, I'm here. Um, yeah, I, I kind of arrived. So I love to be really active in different NGOs uh, and uh, different, um, I forget the English word for this. Um, yeah, working for free for 
things that make me passionate. Like, uh, for example, I'm a mentor at coffeecodebreak.com. This is mentoring for women in tech from women in tech. Um, if you would like, you can book a session with me and we can talk about anything you like. Lovely platform. I've also been guest at Data Plus Women um, and also following their events very closely. Uh, Tableau User Group Germany, I help organize this. Um, and also I'm newly elected leader of the Tableau User Group Munich. Next one is uh, taking place 29th of April, but it will be in person. So no digital event, but if you are in Munich or if you know somebody in Munich, I'd be happy to host them and um, tell them to come. And uh, it will be lovely to have a in-person event again. So during all of this and now working for more than two years, am I still doing art? Am I still an artist? And I'm happy to answer yes. This is a picture of me and my colleague um, at an exhibition. I'm still very active. I spend all my money that I have now on art supplies, which is lovely. Um, uh, and uh, it's just it's just been such a joy to to still be be so active. Really, very happy and blessed about this. So, if you have any questions about um, changing careers or about any of the topics I mentioned before. Uh, let's connect. I'm on different platforms, as I mentioned before, Coffee Code Break, Tableau Public, LinkedIn. I publish all my art on Instagram and Twitter. So happy to connect with anybody. And, um, and yeah, let's see if you have any questions for me. Sorry. Uh Thank you so much, Julia, for the session. I really, really enjoyed your memes, especially all the pictures. <laughs> Very interesting. And also, I would just like to say that I just love how so many different life experiences of yours have finally brought you here. That's actually admirable. It's really good. And we also have a couple of questions in the chat. So the first one mm -hmm. is from Tanmay. And, you know, he has been trying to make a lot of dashboards, but... Uh, not been exactly been able to get, you know, at the end what he wanted in terms of maybe information or maybe design. And he just wants to understand how do we can go about it, how to reach or sort of how to think on that level as to actually get the final product which you may be envisioned in the beginning. Uh, so this is very interesting because usually people uh, stop doing art because they're not able to produce something that is... Um, corresponds to their vision right and, and then they're disappointed that they're doing stuff more that's more ugly so I would um, suggest um, so there are two ways either you really sketch out your vision with pen and paper um, this way you can really clarify because in your mind you usually smooth over things that you don't know and you kind of interpolate missing parts and when you do a sketch you get more clear on what you actually want. Um, but the other uh, thing is to really try not to have this vision at all, but just to, um, um, to go into it and look what is there and uh, try to build something from what is there. In my art practice, I usually use, use the second approach where I just look where's the technique taking me, where's the motive taking me and, and making something from there. And their motivation is more curiosity instead of perfectionism. That's a really interesting take. I usually follow the second part as well. <laughs> because yeah. maybe I'm also too lazy to draw stuff. I know a lot of people do. I guess even person does that. So yes. that's really interesting. Yes, I, I usually prefer first just uh, drawing a sketch of everything and then I'll try to put out the elements. Uh, so one, we have one more question. I think it's somewhere similar to this, but uh, Akshay wants to know that uh, he has been building basic dashboards with boring KPIs, but he wants to <laughs> go to the next level of making eye-catching dashboards. So uh, what's your take on that, Julia? Like uh, he, he, he's saying that, uh, whatever he's uh, trying to do it's totally boring it, the kpis are boring and he wants to go at the level where it can be like uh, 
you you are looking at it and you are saying that wow so uh, what would you like to suggest to him so this uh, thing with when you look at a dashboard and you say wow you have to be very careful about it because first of all it's different for everybody and second of all sometimes you have dashboards that have like this big wow effect but when you look closely there's not really it's not really a good dashboard because um it just appears to be spectacular so i would um suggest that you go more into the storytelling of things that you more look for what are your KPIs telling you and what story do you want to tell with the data and then structure your data so that you really drill into the data. When you say you have boring KPI, KPIs, so try to find out what they really tell you. What is the story? Is it like the development over time or do you have a pattern like every Sunday it's weird or uh, is the year over year? Um, comparison, like how has it been last year to this year, and then try to explain those findings and, and go deeper. So go more into the storytelling and not so much into the, oh, does it look cool? Because this can really smooth, uh, this can really deceive um, about the quality. Yeah, that's a really great answer. In fact, you know, I also feel that sometimes people focus so much on making those fancy charts. And even I, uh, you know, being in this field, sometimes I just don't understand how to read them. They're so fancy, right? Mm. And maybe sometimes people lose the storytelling part of it and go into making it look eye catching. So that's really yeah, important and to know. Having a fancy chart is awesome, if but only if it comes from your story. You should have the story and then think about what chart would support my story, not the other way around, not thinking like, oh, I wanna do a Sankey diagram. Let's see if I can like squirm this data into a Sankey diagram. Um, yeah, and uh, that, that I, was, I would say um, makes a good quality dashboard and the eye-catching part, I don't know, it's different for everybody. Yeah. Also, we have one more question from Ansula. I mean, your book collection is really impressive. I would like to have that myself. Uh, she's asking if there are some good data visualization book suggestions. Preston has already you know, suggested some, but since you have a lot, are there maybe more which are good? Um, so would you like to know some books or? Um, okay, so my favorite you've been collecting these books right so i'm sure you would you would have a great collection so it would be lovely to know which are those recommended books from your side um i love um the book data feminism because i think it's so important it's not about women it's about minorities in general and how there's a lack of data on everybody that is not a white male um, I think that is re really important to also understand the limitations of data. And uh, so the absence of data is sometimes more revealing than the data we actually have. And um, okay, let me get this one second. I love Dear Data. Um, and also this. So I love Dear Data because it's such a playful way of, um, uh, of, uh, of dealing with data. And uh, they were writing postcards to each other and, um, and, and visualizing uh, their day-to-day -day data with you know, just pen and paper. I think that's a great creativity wow. exercise and also a great way of thinking about that data is just encoded information and that you can encode anything then storytelling with data is really good to get this measure of why do you show a bar graph or a scatter plot and to really think about why each element is important and, and not to just show data, but to have in mind that there's a journey or a story behind it. But I also love to have these historical books of people who started data communication or who started uh, thinking about this so, so um, and let me see if I can find my favorite visualization. Um, it's about how long it takes you to go to New York. By, and I love this because it's so absurd because now we can just fly to New York within a few hours, but 
here each wave, so there are waves, each wave is a day. And here you can see how many it took you 70 days for Columbus to reach New York, and then how it gets smaller and smaller, and also how that city outline changes. So I love to also look at, at historical, um, um, where does data visualization come from? How did it develop? Um, and yeah, that would be that would be my top picks. Wow, Sam goes from some shopping like this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so always when I have my birthday, I buy them myself because they are quite expensive, yeah. and I know. so it's un unfortunately not possible to yeah, yeah. to yeah. especially most of them get them get imported to India. Me and Tristan were just talking about it, you know. Yes, <laughs> it costs a lot. But I would love to see some some examples from India. I mean, uh, some infographics. I also consume a lot of infographics, like a collection of Indian infographics designers, or um, or, or to see examples from there. I think it would be very rewarding to also look at that. That's a great idea. Send them to me, all right? <laughs> when you find them. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, it it was a really great session, Julia. I pretty much like the the honesty and the transparency that you had in your presentation. That's something not everybody talks about because uh, we always see uh, someone like uh, he started from somewhere. Now he's a consulting manager, or he's a data artist, or data journalist, or data scientist, but there is a struggle and we should know that <laughs> yeah. the struggle is real it is i can vibe with you because i also come from a different domain so uh, there is a struggle and somehow always because uh, this uh, whatever i'm see speaking right now it's totally for those who are trying to do the who are trying to make a career transition because there will be a time where you will feel that this is not it this won't work out but at that stage, just believe in yourself. That's what I actually did. There was a time when I just thought that it won't work. It won't work. Like, but I said, like, I have come now this long, like it's been six to eight months. Let's push it further. Let's see how it goes. Take your time. Yeah. So take your time and believe, your, believe in yourself. That's what my suggestion would be to add up to whatever Julia just mentioned uh, because uh, it's really important uh, if you're trying to make a career transition and it's somehow a very difficult and uh, important step as well because uh, leaving everything what you had and then just diving in. So that's, uh, it's something uh, cool as well <laughs> to talk about when you have actually uh, implemented it successfully. So uh, thanks, Julia, thanks uh, for- you're welcome. Thanks for the advice and your story because uh, it really inspired me and I hope uh, it, it has inspired many of us as well. And uh, so uh, if uh, anyone, if you have any more questions, we can talk about it. And uh, I'm just putting it uh, because we talked about uh, in this uh, session, We first we talked about minimalism and then we talked about uh, coming up uh, to becoming a data artist. Also, we talked about there about uh, how to select the KPIs. So I'm just putting on link. Uh, that's uh, something I would like all of you to go through uh, if you haven't. Uh, this is a simple dashboard. And uh, for those uh, who were just uh, talking about that uh, we are building boring KPIs and we want to make eye-catching, uh, first go through this visualization actually because this is a visual vocabulary and I liked it pretty much uh, because uh, for every type of uh, data relation that you want to establish, whether it's correlation or whether you want to show the deviation, there are specific charts that uh, are there to that particular relation. So uh, please go through this particular visualization and I'm sure that will help you in selecting your KPIs as well. And uh, you can anytime uh, reach out to us, uh, I think uh, uh, you can find us uh, pretty much easily on LinkedIn as well as on Twitter. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, 
I hope uh, any of the attendees do not have any more questions. So uh, I think that's all for today. And uh, wish you International Women's Day again. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the session because I pretty much enjoyed it. Uh, there was so much to learn and uh, there was so much inspiration as well. So thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you Ansula and thank you Julia for uh, coming over and speaking all about yourself and what you have done right now. So it was great. Thank you. Thanks for giving the opportunity guys. Thank you so much. I'm here. It was great to be a part.